Mark chapter 6, verse 14 to 29. Hear now the word of God. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has raised from he has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles and high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced, and please, Herod, and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately, she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of God. We have been working through the gospel according to Mark, week by week, verse by verse. And today we come to this passage. Mark chapter 6, verse 14 to 29, where it describes the beheading of John the Baptist. The title of today's sermon is The Enlightened Conscience. And as we dive into today's passage, we are going to see King Herod's conscience is enlightened. It is being troubled. It is being gnawed at. He knows that he is guilty before God. But before we actually get into the details of this historic event, we need to define a few terms here. What is conscience? What does it mean by conscience? In the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith that we subscribe to, Chapter 21 is on Christian liberty and liberty of conscience. And in paragraph 2, it actually says, God alone is Lord of the conscience. Our conscience is only answerable to God. But what is the conscience? What exactly is the conscience? When we say Herod had a guilty conscience, what does that mean? The conscience is basically a moral compass. It's a moral sense of right and wrong. God's righteous law is written in the hearts of men. We don't need a law to actually say, thou shalt not murder, before you actually know that murder is wrong. No, we know murder is wrong, because God's law is, has, has been written in the hearts of men. 
But more specifically, the conscience is made up of three faculties, the mind, the heart, and the will. The mind is to understand. The heart is to be convinced or convicted. The will acts out. So when one of these faculties is out of place, you realize that your conscience is not at peace with God. Take for example, your mind understands that stealing is wrong. Your heart is convinced that stealing is wrong, but yet your will acts to steal something. Even when there's no one watching and no one actually knows that you stole, you know you have done wrong. You realize that you have a guilty conscience. Take another example. When you actually hear the word of God, you hear the word of God being preached, you understand God's word, you understand his commands. You are convinced that this is God's word and you're convinced that you have to obey Christ and follow his commands. But yet you do not do so. You do not do as Christ has commanded. You realize that you feel very guilty. Your conscience is eating you up from the inside. So the mind, the heart, and the will acts together to form your conscience. If your mind understands it, but your heart is not convinced of it, but yet you do it, you realize that you are not at peace as well. One out of the three, if it's out of place, your conscience will start troubling you. So the conscience is what God has given to us, and it's only answerable to God, not to any man. Most people think that your conscience is only a nuisance. It's rather just something that is nagging at them that stops them from doing what they enjoy. They do their best to suppress their conscience, to override their conscience so that they can actually have fun, so that they can actually be free of guilt. When we suppress our conscience, we do that to our own peril. So as we dive into this passage, we need to understand what is the conscience? Because first, we actually see here a portrait of King Herod. King Herod actually has a guilty conscience. Do not confuse who this King Herod is with other King Herods that are being mentioned in the Bible. The King Herod that is mentioned here is Herod Antipas. It is not Herod the Great. His father is also named Herod, Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one who actually asked for all the babies in Bethlehem to be murdered. You remember that? When Jesus was born, King Herod heard that from the wise man that there was actually this great king that is going to be born, and he ordered for all the baby boys to be murdered. That was his father, Herod the Great. But he had died soon after that mass murder. And this is his son, Herod Antipas, otherwise also known as Herod the Tetrarch. Why is he called Herod the Tetrarch? It was because Herod the Great, when he was ruling and he died, his kingdom was divided into four different regions. Four different regions, Tetra, four. Four different regions. So his son, Herod Antipas, became the ruler of the region of Galilee. He became the king, Herod, the Tetrarch. The Tetrarch meaning one out of four kingdoms, one out of four regions. So he reigned in the region of Galilee. And by the time this incident took place, Herod Antipas had been married for 20 plus years to the daughter of a king and of a neighboring country. It was a Nabataean king. It's a nearby province. Herod Antipas was married to the daughter of a Nabataean king. But when Herod Antipas went to visit his brother Philip in Rome, he met his brother's wife. 
Philip's wife, Herodias. And what happens? He allows himself to fall in love with his brother's wife. He falls madly in love with her, that he even proposed to her. And guess what? She actually accepts his proposal. She accepts on the condition that he gets rid of his current wife first. And so they had an agreement that if they want to be together, they each have to get rid of their spouse. So Herod Antipas, he left his wife of more than 20 years. And Herodias, his brother's wife, left his brother Philip. So Herod Antipas now had a guilty conscience. God had planted deep within him this mysterious thing called the conscience. His mind understood. Understood what? Remember Leviticus 18, the Old Testament law in Levit Leviticus 18, verse 16, it says, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness, and they shall be childless. He, Herod Antipas, was convinced and convicted of the law of God. But yet, he went ahead and took his brother's wife. And his conscience was cutting to the core of it. By whom? Why is his conscience troubling him? It was because of John the Baptist. John the Baptist confronts Herod, point blank, telling him in verse 18, because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. John the Baptist was a prophet speaking God's truth. He did not care whether you are a king or whether you are a peasant. It is God's truth. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And in a parallel passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, Matthew 14, verse 5, we actually read that Herod wanted to put John the Baptist to death. He wanted to murder John the Baptist because it was killing him in his conscience. But again, his conscience would not let him do it. Then in verse 20, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. You see here, King Herod was a powerful man, but he was brought to his senses by the preaching of the word. You see this in many different parts of scripture. You see it in Acts you remember the, the Roman governor, Felix? He trembled when Paul the apostle preached to him and told him of the judgment that is to come. He trembled and he shouted, Enough! Get him away! The word of God pierces the conscience of people. You know that this is God's word. You know that it is coming from God. It might be a preacher saying those words, but it is God's word contained within the scriptures. You understand it. You're convinced of it. But yet, they did not do so. And you see here, what did Herod do? He decided to put John the Baptist in prison. Why? Verse 19 tells us, it was because his wife, Herodias, his wife, Herodias, did not like the fact that John the Baptist was constantly gnawing at their conscience. John the Baptist was constantly poking at the conscience of Herod, and Herodias wanted him dead. But Herod, Herod Antipas, he feared John. He feared John because he knew that this was a man of God, anointed by God Almighty, and he kept him safe. How did he keep him safe? By putting him in prison. Then in verse 20, when Herod heard John preach, he was greatly perplexed, and yet 
he heard him gladly. He was glad to actually hear John preach. Can you imagine this? Think about it if you were to be there. John the Baptist is in prison. He's probably part of the palace prison in one of the dungeons. And then once a week, to the astonishment of the people in the palace, John the Baptist with his chains is being brought out of the dungeon, out of the prison, with chains around his ankles, he goes up to the royal chambers, and Herod would then go and listen to John the Baptist preach. And it would happen time and time again. John is brought from the dungeon to preach, and Herod comes in and listens. Herod didn't just listen to him once and say, Oh, I don't agree with what you're saying. Be done here. Get him out of here. No. We see that in verse 19. In verse 20, that he gladly heard him. He listened to him often. He didn't just have a fleeting acquaintance with this truth. His mind understood what was being preached. His heart actually believed it. And John, John the Baptist, Despite being in chains, he spoke boldly and confidently to the king. You must turn from your sins. That was the message of John the Baptist from the very beginning. Do you remember in Mark chapter 1? Mark chapter 1 verse 4. John the Baptist was preaching. And what was, his, what was he preaching? It says there in John 1 verse 4. Sorry, Mark 1, verse 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John the Baptist was preaching repentance. He preached to Herod that you are committing adultery. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Repent from your sins because there is a judgment day that is to come. And week after week, John preaches the gospel of Christ and repentance of sins and faith in Christ alone. And this goes on and on and on. And King Herod is trembling in fear. He feared John. He knew that he was sinning. His mind understood it. His heart was convinced of it. But yet Herod was not willing to let go of his sinful pleasures. He was prepared to listen, yes. He was prepared to acknowledge John as a man of God, yes. He feared John and protected him, yes. But there was one thing that he would not do. He would not cease his adulterous actions. He would not cease his acts of adultery. That was something that he loved more than his own soul. Then what happened? One day, in verse 21, Herod, on his birthday, he gave a feast, a feast for his nobles, the high officers, the chief of men of Galilee, all the high officials of Galilee have gathered to celebrate Herod's birthday. And the daughter of Herodias, his wife, his stepdaughter comes in. And what does she do? She gives them a performance. She does a dance. And not just any dance, but a provocative dance. A provocative dance. A dance that stirs the hearts of men. She dances in front of all these men who are probably half drunk. And then we see in verse 22, her dance pleased Herod and those who sat with him. She pleased Herod and his dinner guests. There are sexual overtones in this word please. These half drunk men were basically turned on. Herod is consumed by alcohol and lust. He probably has never seen such a beautiful young woman dancing so nakedly. 
And then he utters this ridiculous promise to give half his kingdom to this teenage girl. Verse 23, Where, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Can you imagine this? This drunken Herod says, whatever you ask, I'll give. And not just that. Not just that. You see that he, he promises, ask me whatever you want in verse 22, and I will give. Then in verse 23, he swore an oath on top of saying that. He swore an oath and actually say, whatever you ask of me, I swear, I will give you up to half my kingdom. He repeats it by swearing. Can you imagine what that was like during that occasion? Maybe his friends and all the high nobles at that time were patting Herod in his back. Oh, you are so cool. You are the man. And maybe they were cheering and laughing and, and, and giving him cheers to his wine. Say, Herod, you are the man. And what happens after that? Verse 24. She runs to her mother, Herodias, and asks, What shall I ask? I can be now rich and powerful. I can ask for anything from the king. Should I ask for gold? Should I ask for land? Should I ask for power? Mother, what should I do here? The mother snaps back and says, Ask for the head of John the Baptist. The head of John the Baptist. And this girl, what does she do? Verse 25, immediately she hurries back to the king and asks, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. You see this young teenage girl going back to the king and telling him, I command and I demand that at once you give me the head of John the Baptist on the platter. Imagine what's going on in the mind of Herod now. Herod hears this request from his stepdaughter. He suddenly comes to his senses and he, greatly, he becomes greatly distressed. You see that in verse 26, the king was exceedingly sorry. He is grieved about the fact that he actually made this promise. He's grieved by the fact that he actually heard this request. He knows that John the Baptist was a man of God, was God anointed, was a holy man. And he was trying to protect him from his wife by putting him in prison. And now he's been caught. He had made an oath. He swore to give this girl whatever she wants in front of all his guests. And now comes this key moment in Herod's life. He has a decision to make. He just swore in front of all his guests that he would give this teenage girl anything she wants. He knows that he was showing off. He knows that he was drunk. He knows that he did not think it through. And he's probably trying to rationalize his actions in his mind. He, he must be thinking, I swore, oh man, I swore an oath. I promised this girl, I can't take my word back in front of all these people. I have to follow through on it. My word is worth something, right? At least. He is now there to make a decision. To follow through with his promise. Or... He could be a man and repent of his sins, repent of what he was promising, that he had no right to promise in the first place. He knew that he had made an oath that was unrighteous. In Leviticus 5, Leviticus 5 verse 4, it actually tells us there, if anyone utters with his lips a rash oath, a rash oath, a rash promise to do evil. If anybody utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear, 
when he realizes his guilt, he is to confess the sin that he has committed and bring it to the Lord, a sin offering as an atonement for his sin. It is in the book of the Old Testament. Leviticus actually tells you, if you have made an oath that is done rashly, that is not in accordance to the will of God, you should not follow through with it. Instead, you should repent of it. Ask for forgiveness. Herod is in a position to make a decision right now. He could follow through with the oath that he made rashly, or he could man up and say, I repent. I will not kill, for that is evil in the sight of God. I will protect him. I will protect John the Baptist. He is a holy man. He is a servant of God. Herod could absolutely do that. He could have done all he could to nullify that oath that he actually gave to this teenage girl. But what happens? He actually looks around himself and he sees all the stares and the looks of all the nobles in Galilee looking at him. And what happens? He makes a terrible, terrible decision. We see that in verse 26. The king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. And so immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded for his head to be brought here. He went ahead and beheaded John the Baptist who was in prison. The whole purpose of keeping him safe in prison from his wife is now the place at which he was to be beheaded. And John the Baptist's head is brought forth in a platter and it was given to this teenage girl and the girl gave it to her mother. Oh, what a horrific, horrific incident this is. What a horrific decision that Herod actually made. You see, we are the choices that we make. We are the people of our choices. We have to deal with the consequences of our decisions. Instead of repenting of the rash oath to do evil, Herod chose to go through with that oath, knowing that it was against the will of God. And Herodias now has her bloody trophy. Oh, how pathetic, isn't it? How sad an incident that is. Because of a drunken oath to a teenage girl, and because he feared his drunken guest, he commanded to have the head of John the Baptist, one of the greatest prophets of that time, in the middle of his birthday party. His guests at that time were probably giving him a toast, saying, you're the man, Herod. Oh, you're awesome. But what do you think this man would say when they actually depart from the party? What do you think this man said when they were heading home in their chariots? What do you think they would tell their wives when they actually get home? Isn't it true that sometimes that happens to us as well? Where we speak very differently in front of our host? This guest must be thinking, oh, how foolish Herod was. What a spineless wimp this king is to allow a teenage girl to manipulate him. What a bloodthirsty, lustful monster this King Herod is. Do you think for a moment that Herod actually gained the respect of his guests by beheading John the Baptist? Over a drunken oath that he made to a teenage girl? He would have gained more respect if he would be a man and stand up and say, I made this oath drunk. It was not lawful for me to do so. And I repent. But he did it for them. We see that in verse 26. Because of his oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. 
He did it for the guests around him. But yet, none of them had any increase in respect for him. What a pathetic scene. But the fact remains, many people will deny their conscience, will deny what they know is right when it comes down to the wire. Because of what the family will think, because of what your colleagues may actually think, because of what your friends may actually say, what the nobles around you actually would say. Oh, friends, have you done that? Have you denied what you know to be right when making a critical decision? Have you gone against your conscience because of what other people think? Are you a man pleaser? That you actually want other people to think you as so noble and so great and so charming that you went against your conscience knowing that that decision is wrong. You are not to honor an oath that entails breaking the law of God. Don't try to justify it. Don't try to say, oh, Shouldn't my yes be a yes and my no be a no? I made a commitment here. Shouldn't I follow through with it? Friends, you are not to honor such a promise when it entails breaking God's law. An example I can give you. A young girl falls in love with a young man. Chemistry sparks everywhere. She knows that you are not to be unlawfully yoked with an unbeliever. But yet she went ahead and tempts the boy. The boy proposes to her and she accepts. But she knows that it is wrong. But yet she rationalizes in her mind, saying, I made this commitment, I should follow through with this but yet knowing that God has commanded her not to do so. She suppresses her conscience. She understood what God is wanting her to do. She's convinced that she should be following God's commands, but yet she suppresses it and not do it. All because she's trying to rationalize, oh, I have led him on for so many years. I can't take back my word anymore. Oh, haven't we seen this so often that they walk down the aisle with the conscience gnawing at them, knowing that this is not lawful. It is against the will of God. Oh, far better it is that you repent and submit to the will of God than to suffer the lifelong consequences of being unequally yoked. What about sports? Have you not heard of sports on Sundays? Soccer, football, basketball. Oh, you're part of a team that actually requires you to be part of a Sunday commitment. Every single Sunday, you're going to need to be in a tournament or a practice. Friends, if any activity or commitment that takes you away from the law of God, that requires you to break the Sabbath, Far better it is to actually say, no, I would rather honor my God and come and worship with his people than to suffer the eternal consequences of the wrath of God. Herod, he must be thinking right now that this prophet who was constantly speaking the truth to him was gnawing at his conscience but now he's dead. He's dead. Maybe he can have some peace after all, right? After all, John the Baptist is dead. He can't preach the truth to him anymore. But no, we go back to verse 14. Herod actually hears about Jesus Christ and he says, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead and therefore these powers are at work in him. Herod is feeling so guilty conscious that as soon as he heard of the great deeds of Jesus, the first instinct is, oh, this must be John the Baptist. 
Others in verse 15 say he's Elijah. Others say it's a prophet or like one of the prophets. But Herod in his guilty conscience is enlightened right now in verse 16. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. He's coming after me. Oh, Herod must be living in a terrible, terrible conscience every day without being able to sleep knowing that he has beheaded John the Baptist. He has a crisis of his conscience. He's probably so fearful that John the Baptist has come back to haunt him. But still, instead of repenting and seeking forgiveness from God, Herod would not give up Herodias. He would not give up his lustful and adulterous desire for his brother's wife. He would not cease to, he would not cleanse his conscience. He would not cease his acts of adultery. He was still adamant to live in his sinful, adulterous life. Friends, do you have a guilty conscience? Perhaps it is an adulterous life you have been living. Perhaps it is the lies that you have been telling one after another. Perhaps it is the drunken, lustful lifestyle that you have been living outside of the church. Or perhaps it is a dishonest life that you have been living, trying to cheat others or making life difficult to those who actually stand in the way of your career path. Or perhaps, perhaps, there is someone in your past that you have sinned against and this person has already passed away. And now your guilty conscience is just gnawing at you. Though you seem to have gotten away with them, you know you are uneasy. Your conscience is eating you up from the inside. It is making you restless and fearful. When you're alone with your thoughts, your conscience rises up like a scepter from the past to haunt you. But friends, there is a way out. There is a solution. God has given us a way out. It is exactly what John the Baptist has been telling Herod over and over again. Repent and believe. Christ Jesus was sent to this world to live that perfect life that you and I were not able to live. We have sinned against the perfect law of God. We are the ones that deserve death in hell for eternity. The wages of sin is death and all of us deserve that. But yet God, out of his goodness and his mercy, sent his only begotten son to die on the cross to pay for the sins that we deserve that those who repent from their sins and have faith in Christ alone, their sins would be have paid for, completely paid for. And his righteousness, Christ's righteousness, that we fail to have is counted as ours. And now we are able to be accepted by God and say, good and faithful servant. Not because of anything good that we have done, not because of how righteous we are, not because of how good we have done to the poor or help others out, but only because of Christ and his goodness and his grace to show undeserving people like us. There is a way out, my friends. Your conscience might be eating you up from the inside, but repent and believe. God gave you that conscience for a reason. It is to point out your sinful self, the law of God that is written in the hearts of men. It's to show us that there is a God. There is a God that we fall short of. And we need to repent from our sins and have faith in Christ as our Savior. Now consider Herodias. Herodias, she had a hardened conscience. She left her first husband, Philip. She left her husband to be with his brother, Herod. And when John the Baptist dared to tell her husband, her new husband, Herod, that they were doing wrong, she had no remorse. She was not uneasy. She had no conscience. What did she want? 
Verse 19, she wanted him dead. Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. She would do anything, including using her own daughter, sending her own daughter, her own teenage daughter, in a crowd of lustful, drunken men. She was willing to do that just to get her way. She has become so dead to any sense of right and wrong. How did she get to such a state? Well, verse 19 tells us, she held it against him. She held it against John the Baptist. She bore a grudge against John. And often it is that a person can feel such resentment and such hostility towards another person that eventually their conscience is just silence. It's just suppress. They just want to kill him. Just recently, I actually saw on the news that there was this man who bore a grudge against his former colleague. Years after he left the company, he came back and he put a bullet through her head. His conscience must be gnawing on him that he suppressed it. Oh, friends, let us not let our conscience get to a point where we have no more return. When the egg is boiled, it becomes hard boiled if you boil it too long. You cannot turn a hard boiled egg back into a soft egg. It's too late. When your conscience is suppressed for too long, you would have no regard of God. What is another practical application of this point? This passage teaches us the awesome power of parental influence. You see this mother, Herodias. She had such a great and awesome influence to her teenage daughter that her teenage daughter, when she was offered anything, ask me anything and I will give it to you. What is the first thing that she does? She runs to her mother. Mommy, what should I ask? And what did the mother say? The head of John the Baptist. She didn't even wink once. She went straight back to the king. Immediately, give me John the Baptist's head on a platter right away. No conscience. She just followed what the mother says. The mother has been such an example to her, to show her, to teach her that that is the way of life. And friends, let us not forget that as parents, we are given this power of influence on our children. We are to honor God by nurturing our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You see such an example where Herodias must have taught her daughter that it is okay to use her sexuality to persuade men, men who are probably twice her age, men who are leaders of the nation, but yet through her sexual commands, she's able to lure them. Oh, friends, are we influencing our children as we are? Are we going through our TikToks and YouTube and videos or whatever it is without any filter and our children see what we are actually watching? Are we even setting a good example for our children? where we actually spend time in the Word of God, where our children see their parents say, oh, my parents are loving the Lord because they spend time in His Word. My parents, they cling on to each other and they embrace each other whenever they have sinned against each other. What examples are we teaching our children? Herod had a guilty conscience. He had the opportunity of listening to John's preaching. John the Baptist was telling him to repent, repent and not lose his soul. But instead, Herod chose to harden his heart and lose his soul. Later on in Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, verse 8 and 9, during Jesus' trial and before his crucifixion, we actually read, when Herod saw Jesus, Herod finally saw Jesus, he was very glad. We are told there in Luke 23, he was very glad to Jesus because he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him. And so what happens when he actually saw Jesus? Herod questioned him at length. 
he asked a lot of questions to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He made no answer. Jesus did not say a single word to Herod. Herod had the opportunity to repent, but he didn't take it. And now when Jesus is standing before him, Herod is asking him all kinds of questions, and there's no more answers. Jesus doesn't give him a single answer anymore. Heaven is as though now silent to Herod. His heart has turned into a heart of stone. God has nothing more to say to him. And what about us here? Do we have a heart of stone? Have we suppressed our conscience to a point at which God's word no longer affects us? The fact that Christ laid down his life for us doesn't even affect you anymore. Oh friends, it's not too late to repent and have faith in Christ alone. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. The Lord Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience that you and I are not able to live. He died on the cross and shed his blood for the cleansing of the sins of his people. He rose again to give us power to overcome sin. The same spirit who rose Christ from the dead will dwell in us when we repent and have faith in Christ alone. Herod could have known the power of God to change his life. He could have known God's forgiveness. But when it came to making that decision, he turned his back on Christ. The book of Hebrews further goes on to say in chapter 9, verse 14, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Do you see that the blood of Christ can cleanse your conscience? He died that you could be forgiven. Your soul can be cleansed from a guilty conscience through Christ's shed blood on the cross. Do you understand that you can actually be cleansed of your conscience through faith in Christ alone? If you understand it, if your heart is convinced of it, then what more are you waiting for, my friends? God has given you the understanding of the mind, the conviction of the heart, now submit your will to the Lord and follow him. I plead with you today, repent from your sins and believe in Jesus Christ. For what does it profit a man to gain the world but to lose his soul? Do not throw your soul away. Let us pray. Our Father, Lord God in heaven, we thank you, O Lord, for the word that has been preached. We thank you for the word that you have revealed to us. We pray, O Lord, that you would help us to have a clear conscience before God, for we know that our conscience is only unto the Lord and not to any man. We pray that you would help us to repent from our sins and faithfully follow Christ as true disciples of his. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord. Give us the strength that we so need. Give us the will that we so need. Give us the ability and perseverance that we so need to be faithful disciples of yours. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.